Chapter 6, A Different Little Boy I emerged from the operation a very different little boy. In Matters Intensive Care Unit, I was hooked up to the life support to make sure my heart kept beating and my lungs kept breathing. I progressed well for the first few days until my kidneys started malfunctioning. The kidneys are the umpires of the body. They regulate lots of its functions, filtering blood, producing hormones, keeping to helping to control blood pressure, and move, removing waste from the body. My kidneys were blowing the whistle on my body. The doctors warned mom and dad I might have to be put on kidney dialysis. My parents waited nervously as the doctors tried to trick every trick they knew. Perhaps my kidneys were listening in, though, because just in time they started working properly again. When will Robert be out of danger, Mom asked a few days after the surgery. Each day, one more danger is eliminated, Dr. Atkinson said. There were plenty more days left. Although I was still groggy when I came out of the operating room, I managed to squeeze Mom's fingers to tell her I was okay. But I had been kept under heavy sedatives for the first few days and hadn't managed to speak to my parents. On arriving for a first uh, for a visit one day, Mom was told I had spoken my word, first word since the procedure. Deep down, Mom was probably hoping for something profound or sweet. Maybe, I'm alive, or where's my mom? What did he say? Mom asked the nurse. I want to do a poo, she replied. It wasn't very exciting, but it was the, what I always said when I wanted to use the toilet. It was a sign I probably hadn't, hadn't suffered brain damage during the half day on the operating table. When the doctors took my bandages off, they discovered I'd been replaced by a small, ugly alien. All my messy, sandy brown hair was gone, and it was replaced with a reddened, was all, and in its place was reddened and raw skin. I had long lines of ragged stitches holding the skin together across the top of my head and down the middle of my face, right over the center of my new nose. I had hu two huge, swollen black eyes. Plastic tubes hung out of each nostril, draining phlegm and mucus. Despite all the mess, the doctors looked at me and smiled. They had done what they'd set out to do. My face wasn't perfect, but the building blocks were better. Techniques the doctors had pioneered on me would later be used to help hundreds of other patients around Australia and the world. Nothing comes without a cost, though. My left eye was slightly damaged when it was moved, leaving the vision permanently blurred. Doctors tried to correct it with glasses, but had no luck. Still, it was a small price to pay for better depth perception. The doctors told mom and dad they wanted to operate again in the future, but the hard work had been done. Future operations would do even more to improve my looks, fix the bumps and scars they had been unable to remedy this time. I left the hospital three weeks after the operation. Around the same time, Mom was contacted to see if she and Dad would be interested in having a journalist from the Australian, a newspaper, do a story on me and the operation. They spent some time thinking it over. Mom and Dad weren't sure at first, but two things swayed them in the end. The first was that they wanted the doctors and medical staff who had performed the operation and all the other staff at the hospital to receive some recognition for their efforts. The second and more important reason from their perspective was that they thought my story might help someone else. Maybe there were parents like me who had a child like me who needed a gentle tap on the shoulder and someone to tell them there was hope. After meeting my parents and me and talking to the doctors responsible, the journalist Hugh Lunn wrote a feature that was published in the newspaper in May 1977. The story talked about my birth and my parents' roller coaster of emotions, but focused mainly on the planning of the operation and the procedure itself. All the details of the surgery were spelled out, including the doctor's wonderful ingenuity in making me a new nose out of my toe. When I had been home from the hospital for six weeks, I developed what at first seemed like a slight infection. I was readmitted to matter for observation. The infection proved to be a dead to be decidedly stubborn. The doctors became increasingly worried and I ended up spending five long months in the hospital while they tried to beat it. As a child, it seemed like an eternity, but at least it was a familiar environment. Every time I went to the hospital, I stayed in the same ward, often in the same bed. And while some of the doctors and nurses and ward staff caring for me came and went, 
most of the faces remained the same. Mom would visit every day during the week. She'd arrive and give me a hug. The necklace she often wore, a large coin with Queen Victoria set in silver on one side, would brush across my forehead as she bent down. She would sit with me and we played and read together. Then she would wander the ward, talking to nurses and other regular patients. Dad would visit on Saturday while mom stayed home and made cupcakes, usually with the help of Paula and Catherine. On Sunday, the whole family came to visit. Mom would distribute the cakes she made the day before to the other sick children. Some were for boys ward and some for the girls. With my right leg amputated, I had to learn how to get around with no legs. It wasn't hard. Getting around without artificial legs was a joyous freedom. I no longer had a leg that got in the way. I could crawl or raise myself up on both arms and swing my body forward underneath me. And I could leap onto couches, off beds, downstairs. I was fast in a way I'd never been before. Then I had an artificial leg made and fitted for my right stump. It was a lot easier to keep on than my left. It hugged tightly to the stump and was held on with a strap above my knee. Once it was all ready, I had to learn to walk on two artificial legs. Imagine putting on shoes that have big heels on them. Then imagine getting six cans of soda and stacking them in two towers close to each other. Now imagine trying to stand on top of those two towers of soda cans and balance in your big shoes. That was what it, that's what it felt like for the, the first time I stood with two artificial legs on. It was hard to balance and I had to hang onto railings for support. As soon as I let go, I'd feel my hips start to wobble and then I'd fall over like a stack of books piled too high. It was even worse when I tried to walk. I'd put one foot down and start walking and then I'd sway to one side. Immediately, I'd try to fix it by shifting my weight to the other side, but often I'd get too far and overbalance. Pretty quickly, I became an expert at falling down, shoving my hands in front of me so I didn't smash my already ugly face into the ground. Each time I'd managed a few more steps before falling over and eventually I got the hang of it. It was perfect timing because I'd been off to school in a sh few short months. Mom had no intention of sending me to a school for the disabled, even though she was constantly asked if that's where I was headed. She was determined that I would attend Guardian Angel School at Wynnum, just like my siblings. First, the school had to be convinced though. Sister Pauline, the head nun, insisted on coming to our house to assess whether I was suitable for the school. She wanted to be under, she wanted to understand exactly how challenging a student I might be. So mom organized a visit. Catherine thought it was very impressive that her school principal was coming to the house. Is she going to walk, want to talk to me? She asked mom. Mom paused, probably not, she said, but she may want to have a look at your bedroom. So you'd better go and clean it up. The visit was a success and I was outfitted with a new school uniform, gray shorts and a blue shirt. It was time to see if my new pair of artificial legs and my not so shiny face would be up to the challenge.